We're going to jump into Luke chapter 15, which we've been in the past couple of weeks, the past few weeks. So you can turn in your Bibles or open your Bible apps, uh, follow along with me. The, the story was just read, and we're going to take it little bit by little bit. Last week, we began looking at the parable of the lost son. You may know it as the parable of the prodigal son, and it's one of the most famous, one of Jesus' most famous and, and well-loved parables. And what we've been discovering, and it's actually in a series of parables. There are three parables. We've, we've been looking at all three of these parables over the past few weeks. These lost parables, the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then the lost son. And we've been learning that these parables were told all three in a row, back to back to back. And Jesus told these parables for a very specific reason, and he told these parables to a specific crowd of people. He was primarily speaking to the Pharisees when he told these parables. He, he turned to the parables and he, and he started talking to the parables and or to talking to the Pharisees, sharing these parables because the, parable, the, the Pharisees were so upset with Jesus because Jesus was hanging out with these tax collectors, these sinners, these very sinful people. They just couldn't understand why Jesus, being a good rabbi, would be hanging out with people like this. And so Jesus said, I'll tell you why. And he began telling them these parables. He was saying, I, I came for this reason. I came to seek and to save the lost. And he actually said those very words uh, to another famous tax collector, Zacchaeus. We can read about that in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And this is kind of our, our memory verse and our theme verse for this series. It's just one simple verse. We all can memorize that, right? Let's, let's say it together. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Let's say it again. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And so last week, we began looking at the parable of the lost son and if you're familiar with this parable you know there are three main characters in this parable the younger son the older son and the father so last week we looked at the parable of of the older son or the younger son so let's just let's review that briefly a lot of you know the story but the the younger son he was the rebellious one right he came to his father and he said father i want my share of the estate my share of the inheritance i want what's coming to me and as he said that to his father, it was, it was just as if he was saying, Father, you're getting in my way. I want what's coming to me, and so I wish that you were dead. I don't want you in my life. I just want what I have coming to me. And his father divided up the estate, gave him his share of the property, one-third of the estate, and he, he took it. And he headed to a faraway land, to a Gentile territory, which would have just been just the per per perfect picture of, of rebellion, going to live in a Gentile land. It says he squandered his, all that money, all that wealth that he had received from his father. He squandered it on wild living, and that's where we get the, the word prodigal. Prodigal means spending recklessly or spending wastefully, and that's exactly what he did. Nothing was left, and he was in need. So he began feeding pigs, unclean pigs, which to the Pharisees, this would have, this would have meant, meant that, that he was cursed. He was living a cursed life now, feeding pigs, living in a Gentile land, working for a Gentile now, feeding these dirty, unclean pigs. And then he was starving, and he longed to, to even just eat the, the, the pig's food. How could it be? And so he came to his senses, and um, he, he remembered. He remembered his father's love. He remembered what he was missing out. And so he decided he would return, and, and he's coming up this, with this plan in his head, and I'm going to return to my father. He's probably thinking to himself, when I get to my father, I'm going to have to fall at his feet, and I'm going to have to beg for mercy. I'm probably going to have to kiss my father's feet. And probably what I could expect would be a slap in the face. That, that's what he's thinking. That's a, a, a Jewish boy who would treat his father like that would deserve nothing other than a slap in the face. And his father is probably not going to accept him. He's probably going to turn him away. 
because that's what an honorable Jewish man would do. And he didn't get that, did he? He didn't receive that. For this son's shameful, dishonorable behavior, um, what did his father do? His, his father, uh, it says, you know, as he's, as he's returning, you know, it turns out that his father had been watching for him and waiting for him, and his father runs to him and throws his arms around him. He doesn't even, uh, he doesn't even get the chance to, to beg for anything. His father throws himself at his son and kisses him, welcomes him home, throws a huge party, and so from the perspective of the Pharisees, this young son, this, the actions of, his, of this younger son would have been so shameful and dishonorable and disgraceful. But also to the Pharisees, the father's actions would have been the same. No Jewish man would act this way. This was so dishonorable and so shameful. There's no way. Just disgraceful behavior on the part of the son and the father prodigal kind of love spent recklessly spent wastefully it seemed and by the way that's exactly what Jesus was doing when he was spending time with the people that he was spending time with and so as the Pharisees are, are listening they're, they're doing what they do best they're, they're judging <laughs> they're judging the characters in the story so in their mind, they're thinking, okay, this younger son, he's foolish, he's disgraceful, he's, he's dishonorable, he's shameful. This father running to his son like this and acting this way, he's just as foolish, he's just as disgraceful and shameful and dishonorable. There's gotta be someone in the story that's good. There's gotta be someone in the story that does the right thing in their eyes. And so we come to the older brother in the story. And it's here that the Pharisees find themselves smack dab in the middle of the story that Jesus was telling. They find themselves characters in the story that Jesus is telling. And that's what we're going to look at today. But throughout these lost parables, we've been, we've been looking at uh, the, the contrast between religion and following Jesus. Because the Pharisees are just the perfect picture of religion, right? Perfect picture of religion. But they always found themselves at odds with Jesus. And so we've been kind of looking at some of these things the past few weeks. And, and the first thing that we learned in, in way of review is that religion tends to, to focus on behavior. And when you do this, this is just so frustrating because you, you, you either get frustrated with yourself or you get judgmental pointing fingers at others, which is what the Pharisees were doing. But following Jesus focuses on the Savior. You don't focus on your behavior. You focus on him. And he's the one who changes you from the inside out. We also learned that, that religion tends to, to push people away, like tax collectors and sinners and any of, any of those types of people that we can think about nowadays. But following Jesus brings you near. It draws you near to people who are different than you, who look different, act different, believe different. Religion is about earning your way to God, working your way to God, trying to work your way back into his good graces. But following Jesus is about trusting in the work that's already been done on your behalf because of the cross of Christ. And so today, as we, as we look at the older brother in this story, we're going to see all these things we just talked about and we've been learning over the past, the past few weeks. All these things are going to come together and, and we're going to once again kind of see the perfect picture of, of religion. And so the older son. The Pharisees listening to the story, once again, as Jesus is telling the story, they're probably thinking, okay, finally we get to someone that's good, that's some, someone who's doing the right thing in the story, someone who's doing the honorable thing. But this is the story as Jesus told it. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing, so he called one of, his servant, one of the servants and, and asked him what was going on. So there are just a couple things that we need to notice here. The party had already started, and 
the question that I ask myself is, is why wasn't the son at the party already? Why wasn't he there? Why wasn't he part of the celebration? Because as the older son, he, he more than likely would have been overseeing the estate right alongside his father. But he wasn't there. And, and this type of celebration, this, this was a huge celebration. When you kill the fatted calf, that, that fatted calf was reserved for the, for the most important occasions. And you would invite people from the town. Maybe a hundred people or more would be at this party. Such a, such a huge celebration. But he didn't, he didn't hear the music until he got near. So he was in a, he was in a faraway field. And, and once again, as the older son he should have been right there with his father, overseeing the state, the estate right alongside his father. He, he shouldn't have been in a faraway field with the hired servants. Why wasn't he with the father? But he, he, heard, the, he heard the music, he heard the dancing, he heard the party as he got, he got near, and he, and he called to one of the servants. He called to one of the servants. What's going on here? If he really shared the father's heart, he would have known, he would have known what, what kind of celebration this was for. If he had a close relationship with the father, he would have known that the father had spent his days searching and scanning the horizon and and waiting for his, for his son to return. But when he drew near, he, he didn't go directly to the father. He called one of the servants to come out to him. If he shared the father's heart, he would have known that the only thing that would bring the father this much joy was his brother's return. And, and I think that he would have ran into the party. He wouldn't have called for a servant to come out and talk to him. What is... What is going on here? So all indication in this story is that the older son was relationally distant from his father. He was relationally distant. No loving relationship. The younger son, remember, he had been in, in a faraway country, in a faraway Gentile land, but the, the older son, he was in a faraway field. And that's the picture that Jesus is painting here. Distant relationship. You see, both were lost. Both were relationally separated from the father. It's just that the younger son, the younger, younger son recognized it. He recognized his lostness and he repented and he returned. What would the older son do? So the servant says, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and, and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. And that's incredible. And we're going to save that for next week that his father went out and pleaded with him. So the older son becomes angry and becomes resentful. And from the Pharisee's perspective, this is exactly how the older son should feel. He had, the, he had every right to feel this way. The younger son was the one who squandered his portion of the estate, one-third of the family estate. He squandered it. And so the father now is taking from the other son's portion for this huge celebration. The calf, or the, the, the fattened calf that, he w had, that they had slaughtered for the party, reserved probably would have been reserved for the older son's wedding. The signet ring, the robe, these, these things, they were reserved for the older son. This was the older son's stuff. The younger son didn't deserve the stuff. So the older son's outraged at what was going on. He's, he's just so outraged at all this. And once again, it reflects the attitude of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Just, just as the older son was angry that his father was welcoming this wayward son, the Pharisees, they're, they're angry that Jesus was welcoming the tax collectors and the sinners. And, and just as the older son is refusing to join the celebration, this, this joyful, loving celebration of relationship, the Pharisees had no love for God, no love for others, and they refused to enter into the kingdom. 
In fact, Jesus said this at one point in time to the Pharisees, and we can read about it in Matthew chapter 23. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. And so as we've been learning, religion tends to push people away. Keep them at arm's length. And us versus them, and us against them type of attitude. The older son versus the younger son. The Pharisees versus the tax collectors and the teachers of the law. Tax collectors and sinners. But let's keep reading in the parable. But he, he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my family. I mean, you just didn't talk this way to your father. Look, disrespectful. At least when the younger son came home, he addressed his, his dad as father. You remember he said, Father, I've, I've sinned. I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. But this look, this look reflects the attitude of the Pharisees, this self-righteous, judgmental attitude. Look, I've been slaving for you. Do you remember from last week, the younger son, that he longed to be even just welcomed back as a hired servant of his father's? Because he, he knew that his, his father was even loving and generous to the, to the hired servants. They experienced his father's love and generosity. But for the son, there's no loving relationship. He doesn't even, he doesn't even recognize his, his father's Blessings and generosity towards him. You, you've never even given me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. He's, he's resentful. He's just working and slaving away for the Father. He resents it, and, and that's where religion leads. Because religion is, is about earning your way back to God, working, slaving away. And just like the older son and just like the Pharisees. I've never disobeyed your orders, he says. Look, you know, you know I've never disobeyed your orders. And, and, and he, he says, but when, the, the, the father says, but when this son of yours, let me back up, sorry. I, I've never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. All these years I've been slaving for you. What, a, what an attitude. And he, and he, doesn't, even, he doesn't even claim the, 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 the brother as his brother, this this. This son of yours, he says. This son of yours. He's just slaving away. And notice he's, he's downplaying. He's downplaying his own sin. You know, I've never, I've never disobeyed you, but he's, he's overemphasizing, he's exaggerating the sin of the, older, of the, of the younger brother. He, and I, I think I might have skipped something. Yeah, but... But when this son of yours has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home. I, I've never disobeyed, but this son of yours, not even claiming him as a brother, has squandered his property with prostitutes. Well, how, is, how does he know? He wasn't there. He's just assuming. He's just pointing fingers in, in judgment. But if you think about it, I, I mean, compared to the younger brother, this older son was very good I mean he didn't he didn't tell his father I wish you were dead he didn't take the money and the property and squander it all he did all the right things the older son was very moral good outward behavior just like the Pharisees the Pharisees would have thought now that's a good boy that's a good boy the younger son <laughs> he was the sinner just like the group of people that Jesus was hanging out with, the really bad people. Because religion tends to focus on behavior, right? The outward behavior, and it's, it's superficial. But here's the thing. The older son, the younger son, they were both lost. Both sinners. Both far away from the father, Younger son had been in a faraway country. The older son off in a, a faraway field somewhere. 
But there was one son that recognized his sin, recognized his lostness. In fact, everybody recognized it. They knew what he had done. And then there was one son that looked good on the outside, but he was just a religious sinner, just like the Pharisees. And once again, back to Matthew chapter 22, Jesus saying to the the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, woe to you, teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of of dead and, and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to be people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. This is... This is the Pharisees. This is religion. And so the father says, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. Don't you recognize my my blessings? Don't you recognize that I've given you two-thirds of the estate and everything that I have is yours? I've blessed you in so many ways. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours This son of yours, dad, no. This brother of yours, he's your brother. He was dead and is alive again. He he was lost and is found. And that's the end of the parable. And for a Jewish person, this, this would have been so abrupt. It would seem to them that there was no ending to the parable. It would have just left them, left them hanging. You know, where did what did the older son do? Did the, did the older son uh, repent? Did he come back and, to to celebrate with his younger brother? Did he join the family? Did he join the celebration? And all indication is that he didn't, which is why Jesus ended it so abruptly with the older son still on the outside of the party. And, and this, is, this is such a shocking, surprising, ironic ending for the people listening to the story. This would have been that. Because they found out that it was actually the older son. It's the older son who was the lost son. Not the, not the younger son. The parable of the lost son is about this older brother. This older brother who was lost and could not recognize his lostness. You see, the, the younger son, the really bad one, he, he repented, he returned, just like those tax collectors and those sinners who were gathering around to listen to, to hear from Jesus. But the older son, the, the good one, he doesn't even recognize his lostness, never repents, never returns to the Father. He, he seems to stay at a distance, just like the Pharisees who kept their distance failed to repent of their lostness, failed to join Jesus, and there would be brothers and sisters, these tax collectors and sinners. And so the, the one thing, there's lots of lessons, there's lots of things that you can learn from this, but the one thing that, that I learned today from this story of the older son is that religion leads to resentment. It it leads to resentment, to to resenting God, to resenting others. But following Jesus leads to loving relationship, a loving relationship with the Father, loving relationship with other sinners, just like you, just like me, those of us who recognize our lostness, and turn to the Father in repentance. And so as we conclude, I just have a few questions that I want us to kind of wrestle with. And I think as, as church people, you know, if you've, if you've been in the church for a long time, if you've been around the church, we, we really have to ask this question. Do you see yourself in the older son? Do you see yourself at all when you think about it? Do you see yourself in the older son? Do you feel like you're always working and slaving in misery? I've been slaving for you all these years with nothing to show for it. 
Is that how you feel? Because that's religion. And, and that will always leave you angry and resentful and even grumpy. You notice any grumpy Christians? Or do you find joy in serving the Lord? If so, this is probably an, an indication that you enjoy a loving relationship with the Father and his family. Do you tend to downplay your own sin, to ignore your own sin and, and point out the sin of others, exaggerate the sin of others? Because I think we do that in the church. And in fact, we tend to rank sins. You know, there are some, some small sins that they're, they're just, they're little, they're not really that bad. But those sins, there are certain types of sins that we cringe over. Those are the really bad sins. And, and so a lot of times in the church, we ignore the sin within. We ignore the, you know, the small sins like lying and gossip and gluttony and all kinds of small sins. But yet we point to these really terrible sins on the outside of the, of the church. Look what they're doing. Look at that behavior, that lifestyle. And that's the opposite of what we should be doing. We should be judging sin within the church, within the body. We should be holding one another accountable, pointing out sin in a loving way so that we can become more and more like Jesus. We have no business whatsoever pointing to sin outside the church walls. So do you, do you point fingers, fail to ignore your own sin, or do, do you recognize the greatness of your own sin, the, the, the lostness? Do you recognize your own lostness? Because if you do, that's gonna, that's gonna lead you to the Savior day in and day out, clinging to that relationship with, of grace. Not just, a, 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 not just a past tense, that, that grace that saved you in the past, but daily clinging to him for grace that sanctifies you, to, that helps you become more and more like him. Do you have an us versus them attitude? This is the final one, final question. Do you have an us versus them attitude, an us against them attitude? With anyone, does anyone come to mind? Anyone come to mind when you think of that? Do you have any disdain for anybody? Those really, really bad types of people. Those Republicans. Those Democrats. Muslims. Anybody, does anybody come to mind? Any disdain? Any disdain? Us against them type of an attitude. Those people are people who God loves deeply. God is pursuing a loving relationship with them. So is that your attitude or do you have a, a for them attitude, a welcoming attitude? We are for them. We are always for them because Jesus, Jesus was for them. Jesus welcomed them. If, if, if you have this for type of attitude, then um, it's an indication that you share that seeking, pursuing heart of the Father. It's an indication of, of, of loving God because you have love for others. And as a church, this is, this is so important. At Living Grace, we desire to extend love to community and world, and so we have, to, we have to struggle with this and wrestle with this. And as the church, universal, it's so important. So these stories, these lost stories that we've been looking into, these parables, they're, uh, they're about the Father's love for lost people. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And, but oftentimes, I think the ones who are, are, are furthest from God, furthest from God re relationally and, and furthest from the heart of God are religious people, sometimes church people. And I think it's often very, very hard for religious sinners to see their lostness, to recognize their lostness, to see their sin and to, to repent, to turn from it. And so I just ask if you see any of the older brother within you to, to repent, just like, just like your younger brother. Return 
to the Father from your faraway field and come inside and celebrate with the family. And that's what we're going to do next week on Easter, and I hope to see you back then. The worship